Flagstaff, how we doing? All right. Hey, please make your way in if you're in the foyer. If you're on the live stream, welcome. Um, for everybody that's in here, please stand with us. If you don't know, my name is Johnny. I'm the worship director here. And we like to start all of our services out with music. So please, if you know the songs, lift your voices. And let's praise our God together.
For this next song, we're going to enter into a time of confession. For those of you who are with us uh, week to week, you know this is a common part of our service. Um, then the song we're going to do is an oldie that we haven't done in a while, um, but I do love it for this uh, part of our service. The song is called "Lead Us Back," and it is a the lyrics are a corporate lament. Um, so it's not just sung from an individual perspective, but it's recognizing um, the sins that we often fall into, and it's confessing those to God um, with hopes of repentance. Um, so as we sing these words, you know, even if you don't feel like you're somebody that struggles in these areas, remember we are singing with and over one another as well. Um, so let's confess these corporately and ask our God for the forgiveness that he so freely gives. Throwing 
sing these words and we confess these things um, corporately that many of us struggle at a personal level but we know that um, that even your church can really struggle in God I pray that you would hear those things that you would provide your sweet forgiveness and God that as we experience that life we would leave those sins behind and that that they would not have to mark us anymore. God, we thank you for your forgiveness, and we just praise you um, for the church that you have called us to be and are making us. In your name, amen. All right, we're going to take just a quick moment to greet those around us. Please find somebody that you don't know and introduce yourself. Good morning. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. My name is Jacqueline. Today we'll be reading from Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God, showing no partiality and taking no bribe. He, execu he executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the resident alien, giving him food and clothing. You are also to love the resident aliens since you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. Thanks be to God. You may take a seat. Good morning, Redemption Church. How are we? Good, well, wow, Gra grammatically correct. Hey, Larry, <laughs> good to see you. Uh, hey, uh, my name is Anthony. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm thankful to be here with you guys this morning. Before we get started, we uh, have a, a couple traditions. We won't do one of them. I'm just trying to scare you a little bit. Uh, but we, we love to pray for another local church. It's one of the traditions we do. Almost every week we pray for another local church. And part of why we pray for another local church is we want to remind ourselves each and every week that God's church is bigger, God's family is bigger than just this room. I think a lot of times, especially for us as Protestants, we can forget how big God's family is and what he's doing through Jesus and with the gospel throughout the world. And so we, we pray for another local church every week to remind ourselves of that. And so this morning we're going to be praying for Flagstaff Bible Church. If you don't know Flagstaff Bible Church, they're a church off of Schweitzer Canyon. They've been uh, just a wonderful blessing to us over the years, all sorts of uh, meetings we've had there. They've just let us use their building freely without any questions and, uh, or without having to pay or anything like that. And so 
Uh, so we're just really thankful for Flagstaff Bible Church and, and how they blessed us and how they're a blessing in the city. And so, uh, so will you guys pray with me for Flagstaff Bible Church? Don't just listen to me pray, but pray prayers of your own as I pray. And then I'll also pray for us as we get into God's word this morning and for myself that, that God would be able to speak through me or teach through me this morning. So pray with me. God, uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your... Uh, thank you for Flagstaff Bible Church. Thank you for who they are in this city. Thank you for the blessing that they've been to us. Thank you for their faithfulness and commitment to you, God. I, they are zealously uh, committed to you, God, and want to be so faithful to you, God. And so I'm, I'm thankful for their hearts uh, of zeal, God. I, I pray as they meet this morning, God, that, that you just bless their time, that, that the... That the that as the word is preached, that they hear from you in new and refreshing ways, or just, just refreshing ways, God, and that they're just reminded of, of your goodness and who Jesus is and the gospel, God. I'm, I'm sure the leaders there have lots of things they're praying for for uh, their church, God. I, I pray that those, uh, they see a little bit of fruition of, of some of those prayers being answered this morning. God, I pray for us as we get into your word, God. I think uh, this morning, God, we're, we're stepping into this topic of, of justice, as you know, and it can be a, a topic that's hard for us in, uh, in America to talk about, to think through. And so I, I just pray right now that you would just calm our hearts, calm my heart, that, uh, that we would hear your word and not hear something else, that we would hear from you and what you're trying to teach us. And so, God, uh, I pray that as I, as I preach, I, I allow you to use uh, my personality and my words to, to say what you would say uh, to this group. And uh, yeah, God, I fill me with your spirit. Let this time be a time that spurs us uh, to do justice and to show mercy. And so, Lord, we, we love you and we need you. Amen. All right, you guys have heard me mention the, the show, The Chosen, a few times now. How many of you guys have seen the show, The Chosen? Any episodes? All right. So it's, it's a great show. I mention it a lot because I grew up with a lot of cheesy and bad depictions of the life of Jesus, okay? A lot of very beautiful Jesuses in my lifetime is how he was depicted, blonde hair, blue-eyed guys, and that's just not what he looked like. And so I love The Chosen because it's been, I think, a better depiction of Jesus. And if you don't know the show The Chosen, it's, a, it's basically telling the story of Jesus' ministry among his disciples. And I figured out how to cut a clip and play it for you guys this morning, okay? <laughs> That's what you're paying me to do. I did it. Okay? And so uh, we're going to play a clip. Before the clip plays, here's, here's what it is. It is Matthew 23 put into film form. They're trying to say, what did that maybe look like in real life? And Matthew 23 is Jesus having a confrontation with the Pharisees that's pretty intense. So we're just going to start the sermon off on a great note and let you watch this kind of intense uh, confrontation confrontation that Jesus has with the Pharisees. So go ahead and play that clip now. You Pharisees, you cleanse the outside of a cup and the dish, and then you eat and drink food that goes into a body that inside is full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within Behold, everything is clean for you. Are you saying giving alms is more important than being ritually I'm clean? I'm saying that your obsession with what is clean and unclean goes farther than God intended and does no good for anybody but yourself. We tithe everything so the poor can benefit. Down to the smallest plants grown in our gardens. And to that I say, woe to you Pharisees. You tithe mint and dill and cumin, measuring carefully the last speck while neglecting what is actually important of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You blind guides straining out an act while swallowing a camel. Look at these people. What have you done to help them? We have taught them how to observe God's perfect law. What you actively defy and break and encourage others to deviate from it. All of you, 
This man is dangerous. He's leading you astray. His words bring hope and healing. His words are blasphemous, heretical. And I say woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Take it back. Right now, you can't hear insulting words. Oh, I am just getting started. All right, that's a pretty good clip. Uh, we don't have it on account that Jesus says it, so I'm just getting started. But it's fun. It's fun that he says it. So uh, it's, it's intense. It's a, this is an intense scene. Here's what's funny. I went back and I read Matthew 23. And when I read Matthew 23, I was like, this is, this is even more intense. Like when I read Matthew 23, I go, this actually on paper seems more intense than even how the chosen depicted it. On film. So, so, so why am I showing, why am I showing, I'm going to grab my notes because it has the verse on it. Why am I showing, uh, I just realized, uh, why am I showing that clip to us this morning? It's because one of the woes that Jesus says in that clip is going to be our focus for today. It, it, effectively, I want, or I, essentially, I want to teach one of the woes that Jesus says. It, it, and I'm going to reread it right here. It's Matthew 23. Verses 23 and 24, here's what Jesus says to the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but gulp down a camel. And so that's the verse that we're going to teach today. We have been in this series called The Beloved Community Is. So to give you a kind of idea of this series and why we're in this series, The Beloved Community Is, recently we joined up with a church named Redemption Alhambra, a church that we've been joined up with many years already. And we joined up with a soon-to-be South Phoenix church plant, and we've started a family of churches that we are calling the Beloved Community. In fact, uh, Redemption Alhambra, they've already changed their name to Alhambra Beloved Community. We're going to keep our name Redemption Church Flagstaff, but this family of churches that we are now a part of is called the Beloved Community. And we want to be a, a, a family of churches that are connected to one another, sharing gifting, sharing, sharing certain values and pressing in to certain values. If you have never heard that phrase, the beloved community, it actually comes from black preaching of the 19th and 20th centuries. And it was particularly popularized by Martin Luther King Jr. He used this phrase a lot to say, hey, if we are so beloved by God... What does that mean for us to live out our belovedness in community with one another? And he very much had this vision of a beloved community that just lived out love with one another. And so we're in this series called The Beloved Community Is, saying what we, as a family of churches with Alhambra Beloved Community and the soon-to-be South Phoenix Church Plant, what, what do we value? What are the things that brought us together? What are the things that, that we want to press into? What are the things that if other people join us in this endeavor to be a family of churches together, what are the things that we are going to value? And so we've talked about a lot of things in this series, and today we're going to see that the beloved community is a community that does justice and shows mercy. So to, to teach that today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do our best to understand what Jesus was trying to teach the Pharisees that we saw in that clip and that I just read from Matthew 23. We're going to try to understand what Jesus is trying to teach them through that woe that he says to the Pharisees. And then I even want to try my best to apply that woe and, and what it means for us to, to our context, to our 2,000 years later context. Okay, and all of that will answer the question, what does it mean for us as the beloved community to do justice and to show mercy? Okay, so before we hop into it, I'm going to give you guys another book suggestion. I think I've suggested something like 80 books during this series. And so uh, here's a book suggestion. If you ever want to kind of do a deep dive on justice, which I, I suggest you do, because I think we all have different views that are mostly formed by culture... 
Uh, go to this book. It's called Generous Justice by Tim Keller. Generous Justice by Tim Keller. It is a great, easy read and a great overview of what the Bible teaches on justice. And a lot of what I'm pulling from today and what, what I'm saying today will be some paraphrases from Keller himself. And so I just want to give him credit. I think that keeps me from plagiarizing, right? And so, so uh, read that book. So let, let's talk about this woe that Jesus said in the clip that we saw. I'm going to reread it one more time. I love when I just do one or two verses. I can just keep rereading them. Um, verse 23 of Matthew 23 says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but gulp down a camel. No gnats in my cup. So, so first, to, to teach this woe, let's just start by saying, what is a woe, W-O-E, what is a woe in the Bible? So a woe, according to to a lot of biblical st- scholars, but Craig Keener in particular, it, it's a form of Old Testament prayer. Okay, a woe is a form of Old Testament prayer. Often, it was the it was a sort of prayer of pointed judgment that the prophets would use. So, if you go to the Old Testament and you read the prophetic books, so those are the books by a prophet in the Old Testament, you'll notice they will say things like. Uh, woe to the, you, this evildoer, or woe to you, Israel, or woe to this country for doing X, Y, and Z. And so, uh, so that's kind of how a woe is used in the Old Testament. And Keener thinks that, that Jesus here could be even using it kind of like a curse. Not like a mystical curse, but if you know Jesus, he has a lot of statements that, are, that fall under this kind of be attitudes. He has these blessed are statements or blessed is the person statements. And then he says, who is the person that is blessed in some way in God's upside down kingdom? And the woes are almost kind of like the opposite of that. Cursed are, but more like woe to you. Okay, and so... I'll, I want to be fair. There, there are some scholars who go, hey, there's just mystery around this word woe. But here's what we know. By Jesus saying woe to the Pharisees, he's saying, God is judging your evil, Pharisees, and I'll tell you what that evil is. And then Jesus begins to tell them some of the evil that they're doing. There's actually seven in Matthew 23, but we're only focusing on one of them. He says this, he starts off, he just goes, you pay such special attention to tithing to the temple, right, to giving to the temple. So much so, you give the smallest of your things. You give your spices to the temple. You're so good at tithing. Like, that would be like you guys coming here and dropping garlic powder off in the offering box, okay? Like, this is how good... This is how good the Pharisees were at tithing. And then Jesus goes on and he goes, but as you focused on the smallest of things, on tithing the smallest of things, you've missed the biggest of things, the weightiest of things, the most important of things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. It's interesting that Jesus says there are weightier matters of the law that the Pharisees are ignoring. There are things that are, that are very important to God's heart. And that Jesus says, even by focusing on the smallest things, you've missed it. Because you've missed focusing on the big things. Right? Jesus, even in this world, he goes, sure, tithing matters. Keep tithing. Keep doing that. But you've been so focused on the minutia, on the minutia of the law, and you've missed that, that you've neglected the weightier things of the law, the biggest parts of the law, the most important parts of the law. And by the Pharisees neglecting them, Jesus says they are in sin. It's this metaphor that Jesus ends this woe with where he says, you strain out a gnat 
and you swallow a camel. I never knew what it meant until preparing the sermon, full disclosure. But it's, it's a fun metaphor. Jesus, so, so this is what the Pharisees would do. This is a real thing that they did in Jesus' day. They would sit down to eat. They would get their cup of water, cup of wine, whatever it was. They would, before they drank it, they would strain it out to make sure no gnats were in it. Sometimes they wouldn't strain it out and they would just dig with their grubby little fingers and pull the gnats out because they were so obsessed with ritual and spiritual cleanliness in the temple and uncleanliness, and they knew that if they mistakenly swallowed a gnat, they would become unclean. And so they would sit down every meal, before the meal, and because they were especially holy, they'd sit there and go, okay, are there any bugs in this drink? Okay, I gotta get that one out. Or here, use the, use the gnat strainer. Get me the good, the good one. Get the gnats out. So this is a real thing they did. And Jesus says to them, your focus on the minutia of the law and ignoring the, the, the weightier things of the law, it's... You spend so much time caring about if you drink a gnat, and meanwhile, you're actually making the mistake of swallowing a camel, right? By ignoring the weightier things of the law, they're not just swallowing a gnat, they're swallowing a whole camel. And Jesus is like, that's ridiculous. You care about a gnat, but you don't care about the camel mistake that you're making. I love it. Jesus is fun. When you know what Jesus is saying in the first century context, he's a lot more fun, okay? Okay. I, if I was an extra in that scene, right, Jesus said that, I would have been like, oh, he said you swallowed a camel, right? Like, I, and then there was, you, you have to go, right? Like, that's what would have happened to me. That's what Jesus, though, he says, that's what they've been doing. Because they've been so focused on the minutia of the law, they've missed the weightier things of the law, and that's just as big a mistake as swallowing a camel. Now, just a quick reminder, because as soon as Christian preachers start talking about the law, it can freak people out. So, so to be clear, we are saved by grace, not by the law. But something I think we miss and forget sometimes is the law which is in the Old Testament, and it, it's kind of these ways of living that God has for Israel specifically, the law is still good for the Christian. Part of why we know the law is still good for the Christian is because of how Jesus uses the law, teaches the law, interprets the law. Jesus himself even says he had, he had come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And then you even see other New Testament authors, they use the Old Testament law in different ways and they apply it to different things. So the law, before you go, hey, that doesn't matter for me as a Christian, I would say, hey, it is still part of God's word. It is still good for us as a Christian. And even though you need to understand how the gospel has interacted with the law in different ways, the law can still show us a lot of God's heart and a lot of what it means to be human in the world. And Jesus, in these woes, and in this woe in particular, he's helping us to interpret the law by helping us see what we should pay attention to. And Jesus says we need to pay attention to how the law talks about justice and mercy and faithfulness. Now, now faithfulness... When, when it comes to what Jesus is saying here, it's basically what it sounds like to us. It's, it's an active trust, and it's an active reliance on God. It is uh, stoking the fires of your relationship, of trust in God, right? This is something I think a lot of American Protestant churches promote all the time. I think most of our sermons, even here, talk about what it means to be faithful to God almost every week. But Jesus also includes in there justice and mercy. And he says even if we neglect those things, it's as bad a mistake as swallowing a camel. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does Jesus mean when he is talking about justice and mercy? How do we not neglect them? I think to understand that fully, we have to go to the Old Testament and we have to see how the Old Testament uses the words justice and even righteousness and mercy together and in all these different ways to understand what Jesus was trying to say. Right? I know 
the word justice, in our culture, it's become a bit of a politicized word. So I want you guys to know right here, I want to give us a definition of the word justice that is in line with the Old Testament and in line with what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees, okay? So let's, let, let's see and let's look at how the Old Testament uses three words in particular, justice, righteousness, which is related, and you'll see in a, in a few minutes why, and mercy, and, and so that we can understand what Jesus is telling the Pharisees what they are neglecting. So, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word uh, for justice is mishpat. It's mishpat, right? Tim, Tim Keller, who I mentioned earlier, he says uh, kind of the most basic meaning, and other biblical scholars would agree with him, the most basic meaning of justice in the Old Testament, or that word mishpat, is to treat people equitably. To treat people equitably. Often, in the Old Testament... The way that word justice is used, it was used to say, hey, make sure that everyone in Israel, Israel light or not, get the same rights. And so justice, or mishpat, in the Old Testament, it has these strong connotations of human rights. Often it even ends up being used, like that word justice, mishpat, gets used to say something to the effect of, give people their rights. So, so... To be clear, there's a lot of, uh, this is a very robust Hebrew word, right? Like we, we often think of justice as, as uh, fair punishment. A lot of times that's how we think of justice. And the Hebrew word mishpah, or justice, has some of those connotations as well. But the Old Testament use of it means living in a way that is equitable and makes sure that all humans have the same rights. That's how justice is used in the Old Testament. That's why you get Proverbs, like Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. Here's what Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 says. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. In Proverbs 31, wise and righteous living involves caring for the poor, and defending their rights. Okay, another word we have to look at to, to help us understand what Jesus is saying in that woe is this word righteous or righteousness. That word is actually paired a lot in the Old Testament with the word justice. So righteousness in the Old Testament, it is about being in right relationship with God. That is what righteousness is about. But in the Old Testament, again... This word is much more robust than sometimes how we use it. Righteousness in the Old Testament wasn't simply being in right relationship with God. It was when you're in right relationship with God, you now are in right relationship with others. You begin to live that righteousness out. And, and the way that righteousness is spelled out all throughout the Old Testament is not by like some kind of personal piety, although sometimes it is. Often, it's spelled out by how one cares for people in all sorts of ways. That's what it means to be righteous. And so justice in the Old Testament and righteousness, they, they get paired together a lot because they have similar meanings. And, and God is trying to say similar things. He's trying to get his people to have similar values about how they live in the world. So he, he, let me show you an instance of that happening where justice and righteousness is used in these ways. It's Job, chapter 29, verses 12 through 17. Job describes all of these actions, and he calls them his just actions and his righteous actions. Look what he, what he says. He says, For I rescued the poor who cried out for help, and the father's child who had no one to support him. The dying blessed me, and I made the widow's heart rejoice. I clothed myself in righteousness, and it enveloped me. My just, or justice, my just decisions were like a robe and a turban. 
I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I examined the case of the stranger. I shattered the fangs of the unjust and snatched the prey from his teeth. So when Job clothes himself in justice and righteousness, look what actions take place. He rescues any person that is poor and asks for help. He helps the fatherless child. He, the dying call him blessed means he helps people that are dying. He helps the widow. He helps those with physical ailments like blindness or an inability to walk. He himself became a father to the needy. He helped fight for the rights of the stranger or foreigner or resident alien or immigrant, you could even say. And he fights the oppressors. That, to Job, is what justice and righteousness was. And you will find all throughout the Old Testament justice and righteousness being paired in these ways and described in these ways. If we are going to understand what Jesus was calling the Pharisees out for, we have to understand that this, what I just read, is how the Old Testament uses the words justice and righteousness. Those words almost always, as I read the Old Testament, have a connotation of defending people's rights and treating one another equitably and caring for the vulnerable. Okay, I have another example. We don't have time for it, so I'm not going to read it. But go read this later. Ezekiel 18, 5 through 8. You will see how Ezekiel describes a man that is righteous, just, and right. And you'll notice it has these, a few different connotations, but some of them, or a lot of them, have to do with caring for the vulnerable, caring for the poor. And God calls his people to be just and righteous. And the reason God calls us to that is because he himself is that. Look at what Deuteronomy 10, uh, 17 through 19 says. This describes God. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God, showing no partiality and taking no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves to love the resident alien since you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. God calls us to be just and righteous because we are image bearers and he is a God who is just and righteous. He calls us to acts of justice and righteousness because he is doing acts of justice and righteousness in the world. So that's justice, that's righteousness. Now what about mercy, this other word that Jesus uses in that well? Now mercy, we often hear it described as withholding punishment. And, and that's part of the meaning of mercy for sure. There is this idea throughout the Bible of mercy being uh, this idea of God withholding punishment. But I think you'll find that as you read how mercy is used throughout the whole Bible, you'll see that mercy has much more to do with, with an attitude that God has, and it's an attitude of love and care for his creation. Mercy in the Old Testament, when, when describing God, it's, it's almost like it's used in this way to say that like God wants his goodness for all people despite the mess we've gotten ourselves into. He still wants to give goodness to people who have gotten themselves in a mess. And it's easy for us to think it's just certain people that got, have gotten themselves into a mess. But let's be honest, we've all gotten ourselves into a mess. And God's giving out of his goodness and wanting to give his goodness to all people. That's mercy in the Old Testament and even the New Testament. That's why Jesus in this woe pairs justice and mercy. Here's, here's a New Testament example. If you're, you're going, I don't know if that's quite how mercy is used. Here's a New Testament example that will help you see that this is how the Jewish people and how Jesus understood or really taught mercy. Uh, it's the Good Samaritan story. 
So if you don't know the Good Samaritan story, how it starts is this religious guy walks up to Jesus, and he he basically is asking Jesus questions about what it means to love his neighbor. He knows it's one of the most important commands of all Scripture to love his neighbor. And so he goes, what does it mean for me to love my neighbor? And so Jesus tells this story about this man who gets jumped. He's on the side of the road. He's beat up. He's dying. And two religious people just walk by. And then the Samaritan man, who to the Jewish people was spiritually unclean, was religiously unorthodox, like all these kinds of bad things, he sees this man who's dying, and he takes care of him. He takes him, puts him on his donkey, he takes him to an inn, he pays, he, he binds his wounds, he wraps up his wounds, he takes care of him. And Jesus ends that story by asking the religious man who started the whole conversation, he says, who was the neighbor to the man who was left for dead. And the religious man's response is the one who showed him mercy. Notice, the Samaritan didn't walk by and say, I withheld punishment for you. The Samaritan walked by, picked up, and took care of him. So this shows us that the Old Testament understanding, the Jewish understanding, and what Jesus was teaching with that word mercy was this idea of of making sure that people got goodness and were treated equitably and they were cared for. Anyone that needed it would be cared for. That's how mercy is used in the Old Testament. So for Jesus' Jewish listeners, their definition of justice and mercy, it came from verses like this one in Zechariah chapter 7, 9 and 10. It says this, thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. This is what justice and mercy is in the Old Testament. Now, something just really good for us to see and note from verses like what I just read is often when God was calling his people to live justly or live righteously or show mercy, it was in connection to caring for these four different groups that were just mentioned. Uh, The widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the immigrant, I would say, and the poor. Often when God says, be just, be righteous, show mercy, He mentions one of these four groups or all four of these groups at once. In the Old Testament time, these four groups were the groups that had the most struggles. These four groups were the ones that that probably interacted with poverty the most and were poor the most. And God says to be just, to be righteous, is to care for those four. Uh, Theologians, they they call this for the, the quartet of the vulnerable. And I would say that if you believe the Bible to be God's word, and you believe the Old Testament to be God's word, it's hard to read the Old Testament and not come away thinking that to be righteous, to, to actively be a righteous person, to be living righteously means to be caring for the quartet of the vulnerable in some way. So, when Jesus says, woe to you Pharisees, you neglect the weightier things of the law, justice and mercy, that's the sort of Old Testament understanding they had of those words. That's what it meant. Jesus was saying to them, they spent more time and energy caring about if a bug got in their drink than caring about the vulnerable and the poor in their world. And Jesus pronounces judgment on them for it. Now, now here's what I think. I think those woes are in the Bible so you and I would not make the same mistake. Now, again, remember, you and me, we were bought with a price. Jesus' blood on the cross paid our ransom. Jesus' blood on the cross atoned for our sins. You and I are bought with a price. It is not what we do that saves us. But the gospel is something that doesn't just keep us static or stationary. It is something that transforms us. And I would say Jesus and the Spirit and the Father transform us into righteous people. 
and our understanding of righteousness should come from the Old Testament. That means you and I are people who are called to do justice and to show mercy and that we don't neglect those important aspects of our identity in Christ. So, so the quartet of the vulnerable, it might be different groups for us than for them, but the principle still stands. You and I are called to care for any and all vulnerable people. We are called to bring justice and mercy to the most vulnerable of our day. That is what God is calling us to. I want to read three more sets of verses. Three more sets of verses just to show that this is all throughout the Old Testament, this idea. I'm going to take a quick drink. The first one's from Jeremiah 22, verse 3. This is what the Lord says. Administer justice and righteousness. Rescue the victim of robbery from his oppressor. Don't exploit or brutalize the resident alien, the fatherless, or the widow. Don't shed innocent blood in this place. Okay, I'm going to read Deuteronomy 15.4 and then hop down to verses 7 and 8. There will be no poor among you. And God essentially says in the next verses, if you follow my commands for how to live in Israel. And verses 7 says this and 8. If there is a person, if there is a poor person among you, one of your brothers within any of your city gates in the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your poor brother. Instead, you are to open your hand to him and freely loan him enough for whatever need he has. Okay, and then Micah 6.8 says this. He has told you, O oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. I could read more verses about justice in the Bible. It is all throughout the Bible. I'm tempted. I'm tempted to read more verses on justice because the, the idea of a Christian living out justice and having a focus on that has become controversial for some reason. And I think it's tied to the political idolatry in our country and that many of us, unfortunately, involve ourselves in. But I want to be clear. For us, as the beloved community, doing justice and showing mercy is something that we will do. It is something we value. It is something we will pursue. We will seek justice, we will do justice, and we will show mercy. That is a huge value for us as the beloved community, family of churches. And us, locally, this has always been a value of ours. So, now what I want to do is I want to apply this. How do we apply what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees are there? How do we apply it to our day? Here, here's how I think we do. I think we do it by, by looking at the sp spheres and places in our lives that have injustice going on in them and taking action. Or seeing the vulnerable people, the hurting people, or the people that need care around us and take action. So here's what I'm going to do in this sermon next. I want to talk about five areas of American life that I think are areas or things that are in front of all of us in some way. Maybe not all of us, but they're things in front of a lot of us. And I think there are areas that we could press in and do justice and show mercy in in all kinds of ways. And I, I'm picking five things and five big things because uh, I think sometimes we get overwhelmed by verses like this and we don't know where to start. And so I just want to give us eyes to see that it might be easier for us to step into issues of justice uh, a little bit easier than we think it is. Okay, so, but before I say those five things, I need to say some disclaimers, okay? <laughs> Disclaimer one, okay? We can't all do everything. I, I think sometimes at this church, because we preach through books of the Bible, and the Bible talks about a lot of actions of God's people, we get overwhelmed. But here's what I would say is we need not get overwhelmed. We can't all do every, everything. We said in a sermon a couple weeks ago, what God is asking us to do is steward our lives and be intentional about something or some things. 
right? So we can't all do everything. So as you hear these different things, you're like, I, Anthony just sent me out to join the Peace Corps after this. Like, I, like don't think that. Just go, what's in front of you? What, what can you do? What has God put in front of you? What are you gifted at? We can't all do everything, but collectively, hopefully, the church is involved in all these kinds of things. Okay? Uh, disclaimer number two. Believe it or not, I am not trying to get you to hop on some political bandwagon. Okay? I'm not. I am politically schizophrenic at best. Like, I, it's like I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But um, I... I'm not trying to get you to hop on some political bandwagon. I am not. I say that because sometimes I meet people in town and their first words to me are like, oh, you're the liberal pastor, you're the Democrat pastor, simply because I talk about issues of justice. I want to be clear. I'm not trying to get you to hop on any political bandwagon. I am trying to get you to do justice and to show mercy. That's what I'm trying to do. And what we have to do is we have to do it in our context, which unfortunately our context is highly politicized. So every single issue you could imagine has been politicized. And we love to label each other all these different kinds of things. I want you to press into justice and mercy in some of these areas because I think they're important to the heart of God. Okay? Disclaimer number three. I'm doing my best. Uh, I'm doing my best. (laughs) That's really it. I'm doing my best. (laughs) Thank you. To speak through these various issues that to me seem seem like justice issues. That's what I really do mean that. Like I'm doing my best, okay, guys? If you disagree, that is okay. You don't, this is like a crazy new thing. This is something we're doing in the church now. When you disagree with your pastor, you actually don't have to verbally combat him after. Like you don't. (laughs) Super cool. When people don't do that, I'm like, you're great. Um, we can talk, we can dialogue, we can disagree. But I'm, I, like, if you've already made up your mind about some of the things that I talk about, I just don't know if a dialogue is really fruitful. I often notice, like, people want to dialogue with me, and they're like, what about this? And I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. And what about this? Yeah, that's a good point. And then I go, well, what did you think about how I said this? I'm like, nah, you're still, it's just not fruitful. Often these conversations just feel like trying to, like, fight me and wrestle me into like submission or something okay and so listen we might have different perspectives we might have different conclusions and 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 maybe I do maybe I have different perspectives or different conclusions and that's not always misguided sometimes it's just okay so I just I really again at the end of the day I hope my perspectives push us into loving people more loving their neighbor more all right? I, 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 sometimes I say this, I, I'm worried everybody's like, I'm never going to talk to you or disagree with you again. Or like, you can. Just be nice. <laughs> like, that's, like, that's it. Like, and be open to changing your mind. Okay? All right. Fourth, I'll say this, disclaimer. Before I say any of this, like, actually get in the lives of the vulnerable. I, I think it tremendously changes how you think about justice issues. When you're not in the lives of the vulnerable and you're just arguing about things that we all love to argue about, it's, I think that's similar to what the Pharisees were doing with Jesus. <laughs> like, uh, we, we actually have to be in the lives of the vulnerable before I think we can talk about this in any kind of fruitful way. Okay? So, with that said, the part of the sermon that's going to make our hearts raise a little bit, and that's Okay. Um, because I think that when God calls us to justice, I think when he was calling people to justice in the Old Testament, I probably did the same thing. So, first area, first area to think through is poverty. Poverty in general. So the quartet of the vulnerable, like I said earlier, almost all of them were connected to poverty in some kind of way. Like they would find themselves poor a lot. I, this is part of why it mentions the quartet of the vulnerable. There was other reasons they were vulnerable as well, but poverty was a huge part of why God mentions those different groups, like widows, the fatherless, the immigrant, and the poor. Well, they are. And so uh, here, here's something interesting. In the Proverbs, the Proverbs kind of gives us two reasons for poverty in the world. Maybe more, but two, you'll see a lot of Proverbs on these two reasons. Reason number one, There are people who are poor because they don't work and they are lazy, or as the King James Version says, they are sluggard. That's how I have it memorized. And so that they just don't live into what God has given them as steward. That's one reason. 
Second reason, it shows up just as many times in my reading of the Proverbs. People are poor because of some sort of oppression in the world. It's happening to them rather than them, rather than them doing it to themselves. Now, here's what's interesting. When God calls the church to care for the poor, he doesn't qualify what kind of poor person. He doesn't. He just says care for the poor. So I think we have to think through who in our life is experiencing poverty in some way and how do we care for them. What's sad is many of us, once we get to a certain class in this society, never interact in a meaningful way with the poor or those that experience poverty. God does not want there to be poor. In the resurrection, when Jesus returns, there's going to be no poor among us. If Israel had listened to God, there would have been no poor among them. God sees how sin in the world has made so many people that he loves go without what they need. And he cares about them. And he wants to show them mercy. And you and I as Christians are called to step into their lives and show them the mercy that God has for them. We need to be people that lift up the poor, defend their rights, provide for them, and allow them into our lives as equals. Americans love to argue about the poor and look down on the poor. That is not what we are called to as Christians. We are called to love the poor and care for the poor. There is an injustice in God's eyes when he sees how poverty has affected someone. It is a justice issue. Poverty. Okay, the next uh, area of American life to think about in regards to justice is abortion. Now this is easily one of the most polarizing topic in our country. So I'm, uh, a few thoughts. Some in the room really need to think deeply about where the image of God starts on a person. Because where the image of God starts on a person, that means they are human, and that means they are someone worth contending for, someone worth contending for their rights, showing justice to, defending their rights. I think a lot of people in the room need to just decide that for yourself. Where does the image of God start on a person? In the early church, they believe it started in the womb. You might not know this. In the first century, there was an ability to get abortions back then. You, they would take like a poison or, or a drug of some sort, and it would cause an abortion to happen. And this was something that the early church, they were opposed toward. If you don't believe me, there's a great book on this. It's called Abortion and the Early Church. It's by a great author, Michael J. Gorman. It's a short, easy-to-read book. Read that book, and what you're going to find is that the early church was opposed to the practice of abortion in their day. I feel many Christians today, they've veered away from the belief that the image of God starts in the womb because they don't really believe the baby has the image of God on it when it's in the womb. I think for us as Christians, we have to say, where does the image of God begin? And where the image of God begins is where justice for someone should begin. So you have to think through that as a Christian. Okay, second thing. Many of us in the room need, need to figure out what it means to care for the mother of the unborn and treat her with as much dignity and defend her rights as much as we do the baby in the womb. We, we have to. Often I, Christians bring this topic up to me all the time. And often I note that they have no one in their life that would ever consider getting an abortion. They have not interacted with anybody who often is at the poverty line considering getting an abortion. 
We have to find ways to care for, the, for that mother. We have to find ways to make it easy for her to have a baby. That's what's really interesting to me is, as I've provided ideas for, for how we can make it easier to have babies in this country, then it gets really political, gets really partisan. No, I don't want to do that. And it's hard for me to go, oh, do you really care about this? Or have you been politically manipulated? We have to find ways to care for the mother and the baby. Both matter. Both have the image of God on them. Okay, third thing to think about with this issue. I think it's important for us as Christians to realize there are really complex health issues that are worth considering when it comes to this topic. Uh, We don't have time to get into all of that here, but often Christians can kind of invalidate very valid, complex health situations by not even being willing to consider them at all and, and the ethical issues they raise. And the, uh, thinking through those things. Uh, fourth, I think we have to realize because this topic is so polarized, it might be even polarized in this room, but it's definitely polarized in this country, that means contending for justice in this arena is complex. How do we seek justice in this area when half the country really disagrees with the other half of the country. What does that mean? How do we do that? How do we truly reduce abortions in this country? How do we really care for the mother? I think it's going to take a lot of thought. It's going to take creativity. And it's going to take actions that are a bit more difficult than a social media post about it. I, I, I truly think this is an area of justice for us to press into. It's something in front of us. Okay. Area number three. I think pornography. I think pornography is a justice issue. Now, I know that might be surprising to hear, and here's what I'll say. I know a lot of, a lot of people struggle with pornography and are addicted to porn, and uh, I, I, I don't bring, a br- bring more shame we as a church, I, we'd love to help you with that. We have some resources and classes we could point you towards to help you in your struggle with that. But I also think pornography is a justice issue. Often pornography just gets talked about as solely a lust issue, but I think it's a justice issue. The reason I think it's a justice issue is because different studies out there show that something like 50 to 70, I think I've seen as high as 70%, but I've seen as low as 50 or maybe even 40% of all porn on the internet is porn that has coerced or forced a woman into it or trafficked a, wo- a woman into it. So by using porn, by participating in the use of pornography, it becomes a justice issue because it creates a demand out there in the world to coerce women into it. By stopping your use of porn, you can be doing justice. In fact, I watched a documentary recently, or not recently, in the last number of years. It wasn't even about pornography. It was about women escaping North Korea. And they were being scooped up, kidnapped, and trafficked into pornography because of how much Asian women are fetishized in that industry. Porn is a justice issue. And so I think a use of pornography, it participates in justice. I hate that so many are addicted to it and that it's this painful thing for a lot of you. But I want you to see also it's a justice issue to move away from. Because porn creates a demand to hurt women. Okay, fourth issue, consumerism. Consumerism, we've actually talked about this before, but I think consumerism is a justice issue to think through. How we buy and consume goods, it affects other people, it affects other places, it affects God's creation in all sorts of negative ways. This is something for you to look into and think through uh, that even just by making little choices in what you buy or don't buy can participate in justice because of how consumerism is, I think, a justice issue. Finally, I believe racism to be a justice issue. Every time I bring up racism, it, it, it seems to be the toughest pill for people to swallow. 
So I'll say this. We might just disagree about this. But I will say this. Many of us in this church, many of us in the beloved community family of churches believe that racism is real. And it exists in different ways. And especially our country's racist past has lingering effects to today. Right? In particular, I think how racism of the past and even present day has affected non-white poverty and what I think is the unbalanced prison system are two huge things to think about when it comes to justice and racism. There has been wonderful progress made in this country around this topic, but I believe there are still deficits that can be dealt with. And I think they're a bit subversive now, so we don't deal with them, but I think dealing with them is doing justice and showing mercy. So I do think racism is a, a justice issue. So those are the five topics. I can point you to other churches if you're looking for other churches. Uh, nervous laughter. People are already Googling other churches. That's all right. There's a lot of other topics of justice that are really important and that are in front of us. There are things in front of you, smaller things, bigger things, all kinds of things. And maybe that's what God's calling you to do. I just mentioned those five to just kind of get our wheels turning to what things in front of us could be justice issues, areas for us to press into justice, to show mercy. Because I think that's what we're called to. Years ago, I, I, I was at a, a church conference. And this church conference, it was basically just about uh, planting healthy churches and, and just being healthy churches. And there was a lot of great speakers. Tim Keller was there. And they were talking. And, and then at this conference, they had main sessions, but then they had, like, breakout sessions, like little classes you could take on different kinds of topics, all of these do- topics relating to what it, you know, what it means to be a healthy church, what it means to be the church. And one of the topics that really piqued my interest was this class. It was called How to Stop Violence in the Inner City. And I was just really interested by this. This seems like a very difficult task, and this is kind of an audacious title for a class. And so I said to myself, okay, I want to go to this class and hear what they say. And so I sit in the class, and uh, there was two things I noticed right away when I uh, sat in that class. The first thing was not a lot of people in the class. I was a little bit surprised by that as it's, it's an issue that is brought up a lot. There was not a lot of people, at least at the beginning of the class, there was not a lot of people. And then the second thing I noticed was the largest demographic of people in the class were little old ladies. Now, this conference, it didn't have a lot of little old ladies. It had a lot of guys that looked like me, okay? Bible nerds. Like, it had a lot of people that looked like me. But then out of nowhere, I I go into this class, and now this whole little old lady contingent is spread throughout this classroom. It, that, that really struck me because if, if you said, what's a demographic that should not participate in ending violence in the inner city, I probably would have said little old ladies. <laughs> but these righteous little old ladies saw what was in front of them, and so they cared about it. They were close to the heart of God, a heart that cares about justice and mercy. And so they showed up to a random class about how to stop violence in the inner city. I am not really interested in being a church that preaches good sermons about justice. I am interested in being a church full of people like those little old ladies actually seeking how we can bring more justice and more mercy into this world. If we went away from here and did more justice and you were still so mad at me, I would be okay with that. It would hurt my feelings, but I'd be okay with that because I want us to go away from here doing more justice, showing more mercy. I want us to be a church that does not neglect the weightier things of the law. May that be true of us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. God, what's beautiful about all of these verses about justice shows you see everyone. 
You see everything. You care about everyone. You care about everything. Who are we that you would include us in your plan of justice and mercy? God, I pray that we as a church can step into this all the ways you're calling us to step into. God, forgive me if there are things I shouldn't have said. God, help us if there are things I said but we're all having a hard time or some of us are having a hard time swallowing that pill, hearing what you're trying to teach us. God, help this to not be some kind of legalistic, a different sort of Phariseeism where we're legalistic about this, but help, the, help this to flow out of our understanding of our belovedness and give us eyes to see and then hands and wills that step into these places and do things and make Flagstaff a more just place and that our church could know that we participated in that being so. God, we love you and we need you. Amen. All right, we're going to move into a short reflection time. We do this every week. We just take a couple minutes, sit in your seats, pray to God, talk to God, even just meditate on his word. Think about the verses we read. Or just think about those words. Just reflect. And then in a couple minutes, Pastor Kyle will be up to lead us into our response time. So go ahead, take a couple minutes to reflect right now. Would you please prepare your hearts to enter our response time? Every Sunday, we hold space in our service to respond to the word of God. So we don't just be hearers of the word, but we can do be doers of it as well. And we do three things in our response time. The first thing is we receive communion together. And as we've been talking about in this beloved series, uh, one of the sermons we really talked about being like Jesus, to apprentice Jesus and copy him and imitate him. And he broke bread. He offered up the wine to recognize his body would be given to, for our sins, that his blood would be spilt for our forgiveness. So as we receive communion, we do this because this is something Jesus did and it acts as a reminder for us to remember who Jesus is and what he's done for us. The second thing we do is 
we we take a time for offering we have boxes set out back if you have cash check or changes drop them in uh, if you you can text the number on the screen or you can give online and the third thing we do is we sing we worship uh, we just take time to praise god with our voices and with our bodies um, if you're serving communion would you please come forward and get prepared if you need gluten free or less germ options to my right there's a cart over here so feel free to help yourselves to that as well and once the uh, communion servers are ready uh, go ahead and line up so if you would all stand for with me generations rolling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries Holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. And if you've been forgiven, and if you've been redeemed, sing the song forever. If you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name, sing the song forever to
the King of Kings. Holy, you will always be. Holy, holy forever. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name. Stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name, it stands above them all. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name, it stands above them all.
to life from ashes lifted from death risen with him now I stand in confidence I know that all the wreckage of my choices you have turned to life from ashes lifted from death risen within now I stand in confidence oh Lord rich in mercy how you love me too much to let me see lost my salvation sent from heaven and my sin to the cross rich in Guys, keep clapping to the sound booth, sound booth, the light booth, video booth. Pete killed it on playing that video. Perfect. You guys can take a quick seat. Uh, Justice part two. Here we go. No, uh, <laughs> a few announcements before you guys go. Hey, first announcement is uh, this Good Friday service coming up on Good Friday in this room, 6:30 p.m. Okay, 6:30 in this room. That's where our Good Friday service will be. Second thing, members' classes are coming up. If you're looking to become a member, to deepen your commitment to our church, uh, come to the membership classes. You can even come if you maybe don't want to be a member and you just kind of want to see a uh, more extensive vision for our church, and, and especially around doctrine and different things. Uh, it's great. The, there are three different classes. There are April 7th, 14th, and 21st. If you're interested in becoming a member, stop by the Connect Desk, fill out a Connect card or uh, I think there's even a member sign up on the iPad uh, as well. You can fill that out and we'll make sure you get the intel on that. We also have baby dedications coming up in April. Do I know the date? No. Uh, but it is in April. <laughs> I just forgot what date it is. So if you are interested in uh, having a child or baby dedicated, it could be either or uh, to the Lord, just something we do as a church, stop by the Connect Us, sign up for that as well. And then one last quick announcement. We are now hiring two part-time positions. They're both Sunday related. One is a uh, Sunday service coordinator. The other is a setup and tear down kids coordinator. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts on Sundays, and so we do our best to try to pay people part-time if we can uh, instead of just rely on volunteers. And so if that is something you're interested in, stop by the Connect Us and just say you're interested in that, and I'll make sure to connect with you and uh, have you send an application of, of some sort. So uh, those are all our, our announcements. Let me pray a, bl a blessing and a benediction over us. If you have any questions, stop at the Connect Desk. But God, may we do justice and show mercy and walk humbly and do kindness. May you give us eyes to see our neighbor. May Monday through Saturday this church always be marked as people that do justice and show mercy and know who our neighbor is instead of argue about it. God, we love you and we need you. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys next week.